uh, thank you for connecting to another episode of our series Libriamo from Italy with Books. I am Chiara Durazzini and I am the event coordinator at I am Books, the Italian and Italian American bookstore in the north end of Boston. Please come and visit. Uh, the bookstore is open and uh, we are having a lot of in-person events. The series Libriamo from Italy with Books focuses on conversations with Italian authors whose works are being translated and released in their English uh, translation. It is organized in partnership with Fitch, Friends of Italian Cultural Center Boston, whose whose mission is to establish a hub of Italian culture and preserve our rich Italian heritage by creating programs and content and is under the auspices of the Consulate General of Italy in Boston. Thank you also to Europa Editions for working with us in bringing some of the best Italian authors translated in English. And today, this evening, we will talk about our favorite topic, cibo, food, huh? with uh, our guest, our special guest here tonight, uh, Professor Montanari. Hello, Professore. Buon pomeriggio, anzi, buonasera oh, per lei. Um, professore Montanari from Bologna. Huh? A uh, professor, is a, he teaches medieval history at the University of Bologna, although I know he's retired, but he still teaches, um, where he also teaches food history. Uh, one of the founders and editor of the Food and History Journal, he is among Europe's foremost scholars of the evolution of agriculture landscape, food and nutrition. Hello everyone, I just want to remind you all that this is a webinar so you're gonna see only me and Professor Montanari, you cannot see uh, yourselves, but of course you can uh, uh, write all your comments in the chat and ask questions in the Q&A. So feel free to comment or ask questions whenever you want. Allora, professore, I definitely enjoyed to learn more about this iconic dish that is the spaghetti al pomodoro, ah, spaghetti with tomato sauce. I'm wondering, I know you're an expert in food history, I'm wondering what, uh, um, how did you come up with this topic? What came to your mind in saying, I want to write something, a real research about uh, spaghetti al pomodoro? Well, good evening to everyone. I'm, I'm happy to be here with you, even if a little far away from you. Um, the story of this uh, book, uh, um, is uh, very simple. I am uh, working about uh, food history since many, many years, since the beginning of my medieval studies and then modern and ancient studies, always about food. Um, and one thing, uh, one thing that I noticed uh, um, is uh, uh, a very a very huge tendency today um, by everyone, not all, I, I don't mean scholars, but uh, ordinary people, uh, when talking about food, uh, in researching the origins of uh, food, of a product, of a recipe. And um, I am an historian. So, uh, one could suppose that uh, an historian is the best testimonial for uh, talking about origins. But that's not uh, the case, because I think that uh, paradoxically, 
an historian uh, does, does not mind the origins, but uh, rather uh, it, he minds, uh, uh, is interested to see what happens after the origins of something or someone. Uh, I, I want, I, I mean, I mean that uh, searching for the origins of a food, of a recipes, um, often is uh, thought as a way to find the true, the real uh, meaning of something. And uh, with this book, my aim was to, uh, uh, to tell exactly the contrary of that. Uh, I mean, uh, to tell that uh, uh, making food history, but I could say history uh, in general, um, means to be attentive at uh, uh, the processes, the changes, the encounters, the meetings, what happens in, in the world, in the history, and this only can explain what uh, something becomes during the time. So, what for for, uh, for uh, showing this idea, um, for uh, deconstructing this uh, myth of origins, this is uh, the uh, original origin title of the book in uh, Italian, uh, the, myth, the Myth of Origins, and the subtitle is what here in, in the English book has become the title that is a short history of spaghetti with tomato sauce. Um, so the myth of origins, um, I want to deconstruct the myth of origins, starting from uh, um, a, a very nice uh, expression of Mark Bloch. Mark Bloch was, uh, has been, I think, the, the, the most uh, important history, historian of the uh, 20th century in Europe. And uh, um, uh, he used uh, a, a very nice metaphor uh, saying that uh, at the origin of every oak, there is an acorn, but not all acorns become oaks. And what uh, interests the historian is to understand which encounters, uh, which uh, uh, envir environmental conditions, uh, uh, historically speaking, economic, social, technological, political, cultural conditions made possible the development that allows an acorn to become an oak. So, uh, and I, I want to demonstrate this theory um, on a very concrete level, talking about food, choosing a, a very iconic dish of Italian cuisine. Uh, I, I think that uh, Italian cuisine is uh, renowned, renowned in the world uh, for, for, for many dishes, but if you say spaghetti with tomato sauce, you immediate, in, immediately uh, think of Italy. So this is uh, the identity of Italy um, incorporated in this dish. So making the history of this dish uh, is a way to show, for me, has been a way to show that uh, going back to the origins of this uh, dish uh, does not mean, mean to, to find uh, Italian cuisine, but means uh, to find uh, uh, different cultures, uh, different peoples, uh, 
different countries in different times and centuries, and only the meetings among all these stories made it possible, passing the time, to create a dish that now, today, has become, is perceived as a, the symbol of, a, of Italian cuisine. I mean, this is an Italian dish, surely, but its origins are not Italians, are spread all over the world in many, many centuries. This was the idea. Uh, if you want, uh, this is sort of uh, political book, not only gastronomical one, because uh, this is a political idea, not not to to find ourselves in the past uh, in a mythical, in a mythical or mythical, mythical, in a mythical past, uh, but uh, to 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 try to to see how we, we have become what we are today. The identity is not uh, in the past. Identity is today. Making uh, an assemblement, uh, making to do together many fragments, many pieces of uh, stories that uh, do not belong to us. So it's the chance, basically, right? The chance, il caso, eh? Of, uh, of, of putting together various and different factors. Uh, and, and in fact, you have this chapter that I found very interesting, interesting, recipes and products, or rather time and space, right? Um, and in fact, I have a question from, I'm already going to the question because I think this uh, has something to do with what um, the, you were saying from Nicole, and we can talk about the sauce, the tomato sauce later, uh, but she's asking, what did you find the most surprising in your research? So while you were researching from this book, first of all, we would like to know how, how did you discover different things and, and what was the thing that surprised you the most? Well, I was su surprised by m many, many discoveries, but um, uh, surely the, the most surprising has been to understand that uh, uh, tomato sauce is a very, very recent uh, source. And uh, we cannot uh, go uh, back uh, we, we can go back to the 19th century, but not earlier, to find the tomato sauce, while spaghetti are much, much uh, earlier. Uh, we, we can find spaghetti already in the Middle Ages, uh, already in the Middle Ages in Italy, because uh, in other countries, and uh, I mean Persia, ancient Persia, uh, 2000 years ago, uh, the dried pasta was invented, the dried pasta of long shape. Um, the, the, but spaghetti is a, a kind of pasta, obviously, but not all kinds of pasta are spaghetti because spaghetti means long shape pasta, dried pasta. So here's something that uh, can be made and eaten at home, but has a very strong uh, uh, commercial and industrial uh, vocation. Um, the, the first uh, in Italy, in Italy, the first uh, uh, historical uh, attestation, attestation Testification, the, 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 the most a document, ancient. a document maybe, or yes, yes, document talking about pasta uh, is uh, um, 
is a, is a text, an Arabic text of the uh, 12th century, telling that uh, in Sicily, near Palermo, there was a pasta factory that made pasta and exported pasta all over the Mediterranean Sea, both one read, both in Christian and in Muslim countries. Uh, that means that the, the history of spaghetti is since the beginning, from the beginning, um, a story of trade and a story of a factory of pasta. And this is important because uh, often we, we, we think about pasta um, only as the something that has to do with the domestic uh, space, uh, with something familiar. The this nonna is true. that makes yeah. the pasta, yes. yeah. Yes, the nonna, the nonna, the nonna that makes pasta. This is fresh pasta made for uh, eating when it is made, subito. But uh, there is a part of that, another history of uh, uh, dried pasta that can last for many, many months or years. If, if, if you buy a pasta pack today, you can see that the, the, the expiration uh, year is uh, five, six years, four, so long, long time. And, and uh, this kind of pasta uh, seems to be uh, invented to have been invented in ancient Persia and uh, brought to Europe by the Arabs uh, during the Middle Ages, and especially in Sicily. And Sicily is, is a region uh, that uh, uh, must be uh, regarded with, uh, with much attention when you, when you talk about pasta, because Sicily um, is the typical uh, uh, region of uh, many meetings and counters uh, uh, that uh, uh, puts together the ancient Greek and no Roman tradition of pasta, only fresh pasta, but a pasta that was not a, 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 a gastronomic uh, um, genere, genere gastronomico, a gastronomic uh, as today, uh, every uh, recipe book uh, bo in, in Italy, but, but even elsewhere, um, gives pasta a special place, a special chapter. Uh, this was not the case in ancient uh, the gastronomic system. Pasta was made, was eaten, but together with other, other stuffs. In the Middle Ages, pasta becomes a special stuff, a, ki a kind of stuff, a, un genere gastronomico, a gastronomic genre. Yeah, a gastronomical genre, genre or a gastronomical uh, type. Yes, but uh, exactly. now, yeah, I was actually surprised very much about how uh, pasta was more of a side dish in the medieval and renaissance times if i'm not mistaken eh professor montanari it was more of a side dish than a first dish as if it was not a first course until much later yes uh, we uh, perceive pasta today as a first course il primo per eccellenza but uh, this is a very is a very new way of uh, thinking pasta. Uh, the medieval, uh, we, we must say that the concept itself of primo, of first dish, is modern. But uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, we can assume that the pasta could be sometimes uh, the dish, not the first, the dish of a uh, peasant. Uh, uh, table. But uh, uh, the fact is that uh, we only have recipe books 
from the Middle Ages, from the Renaissance and so on, uh, devoted to high cuisine. So the books that are written by court cooks for the lords, for very special people. And in this, uh, in these places, like, like the courts, like the, the, the king courts or the lords courts, uh, pasta was made and eaten, but uh, in a different way from the peasant one. Uh, it was eaten together with meat. Uh, it was is a, eaten as a side dish, as you said, side dish. This is a kind of eating, is a way, is a way of eating pasta that we still have today in the countries, diff, in different countries from Italy. Only Italy is the, the, the country where pasta has become a dish for me, for, for itself. But, but if you go to France, if you go to Germany, if you go everywhere in the world, I think in the United States also, you can have a suggestion to eat pasta with something else. And this was a, a, a very uh, diffused way of, eat the past, of eating pasta in the Middle Ages, in the, in the Renaissance. But we, we must think that uh, we are always talking about uh, elite cuisine. And uh, I think that behind this elite cuisine, there was also a popular cuisine where, uh, in which uh, pasta was uh, more simpler, uh, not, not uh, uh, used as, as a side dish, but. Uh, um, if you don't, uh, if we don't uh, uh, focus only on uh, on spaghetti, but on pasta in general, we can remember that uh, in uh, the, the Cameron of Giovanni Boccaccio, Giovanni Boccaccio's The Cameron, there is a, a very a beautiful and, and famous. Uh, um, a representation of the lands of cocaine, il paese di cocaina, that uh, is uh, described as the place of gastronomical pleasure, where food, where food is abundant and easy to get. And uh, the Italian version, only the Italian version of the land of cocaine, is that of a country at the, the middle of which one could find a mountain of grated case, grated case, sorry, grated cheese, grated cheese, Parmesan cheese, that served exactly to uh, condire, to... To dress okay. the pasta. To dress pasta, because on the top of the mountain, there was a very, very big cauldron in, in which uh, various types, of, various kinds of pasta, gnocchi, macaroni, was cooked continuously, all day long, all night long. And uh, it was uh, cooked and put over the cauldron, uh, going down the mountain and uh, uh, dressing itself of cheese and uh, going down on the earth and everyone that was, that was there on the place would eat this pasta in the quantity that uh, he wanted freely. Um, this uh, this is uh, a, a different uh, perception of pasta uh, that uh, could be eaten for itself and not for dressing something else. And um, so we have two different ways of uh, eating pasta as a dish or as a side dish. 
Um, I think that uh, many peoples, many countries in the world still today eat pasta as a dish. If you go to many European countries, you, you, you can have uh, meat uh, accompanied with uh, pasta or rice or potatoes. So. Yeah, even here in the States, but, I'm usually a little surprised uh, when and, we order something and there is this chicken on the pasta, on the spaghetti. Yes, chicken on the pasta. For us, Why, for Italians, is a little weird, is a little strange. The, 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 <laughs> the, the Renaissance way was um, the contrary, because in, in Renaissance recipe books, we always find this expression, pasta, to cover meat. So <laughs> meat covered with pasta. But I I I I, I wished to, to remember Boccaccio in the Cameroon, the land of cocaine, the mountain, the mountain of a grated cheese, because um, cheese, in fact, was the main condiment for pasta for centuries. And from the Middle Ages through the century until the uh, 19th century. Only in the 19th century, tomato sauce goes to um, enrich this condiment. And um, in the first recipes where we find the tomato sauce, we have in the very beginning of the 19th century, uh, tomato sauce is added to cheese that has been already used for seasoning pasta. So the, the seasoning is always the same, cheese, grated cheese. And butter, then, if I'm not mistaken, right? And the butter. And, and butter. butter. Uh, Otherwise, it would be too dry, maybe, but the butter, eh? Yes, yes, of course, yes. Uh, butter for rich people, because um, butter was a luxury item, a luxury food. And for ordinary people, for poor people, for, for the peasants, lard and the pork fat. And the, the first recipe, uh, where we eat the first Italian recipe where we find the spaghetti with the tomato sauce um, is of the, the, the 30s of 19th century. Mm, it's very curious because uh, um, it's pasta dressed, dressed with the, um, pork fat. And then the, uh, past, the, the tomato sauce is added. This is uh, another very curious thing because uh, today we always think of uh, Italian and Mediterranean cuisine dressed with olive oil. But this is a very recent acquisition in the Middle Ages. So Pasta was always uh, seasoned with butter or lard and cheese. And so, uh, for uh, to arrive to tomato sauce, uh, we, we must wait for, for centuries, for many centuries. As, and as you know, I think tomato come from uh, from the from America, from Mexico. So after uh, Columbus and uh, other uh, other viaggi, you know? other voyages, uh, it comes to Europe. Yes, yes, but uh, we must uh, wait for two hundred years uh, at least uh, for seeing uh, that uh, that tomato is used uh, on uh, on on dishes and. This happens when tomato becomes a sauce. A sauce uh, um, 
firstly on uh, over over meat then then it is uh, experimented on pasta and starting from the 19th century um, it becomes more and more a typical italian way to season pasta that's amazing but let's go just a moment let's go back to the obsession and it's probably my obsession of the origins maybe i'm with block <laughs> that all people i are obsessed with the history and, and and origins because i think this is the right moment for us for you professore to break down the urban legend the myth of Marco Polo. You have no idea how many people in my life, especially my life in the United States, have told me, ah, but you Italians didn't invent the spaghetti, didn't invent pasta. It all comes from China. So please talk a little bit about this. The first thing to say is that uh... Even if you have not invented something that doesn't mean anything for your life, you can uh, take something invented by other people and that uh, can become something identifying you. And th this has been uh, the, the story of uh, pasta in Italy because the Italians did not invent pasta. This is true. But Marco Polo has nothing to do with that because um, Marco Polo uh, in uh, the 13th century, when he goes to China, he finds pasta, but he already knows what pasta is and he only uh, notices he only notes in his diary that uh, uh, he found uh, uh, that uh, some Chinese people make pasta with a strange uh, flour made uh, uh, with, uh, with a tree, with the, 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 the flowers of the tree. And, uh, but he said that but he, because he already knows what pasta is. In the 13th century, pasta is already uh, made, uh, uh, traded, uh, sold uh, in many, many parts of Italy. Um, as I told before, the first historical uh, document for pasta, for spaghetti, dried pasta, is uh, two centuries earlier than Marco Polo and uh, show as, uh, shows us the way to understand where pasta comes from. Uh, it comes from the uh, Eastern, uh, Asia, Eastern Asia uh, countries, Persia, the first place where uh, pasta making is document, historically documented. And uh, when the Arabs conquered Persia, uh, they took all Persian culture, including gastronomic culture, and they took and they brought uh, this culture to the East, uh, to the West, sorry, sorry, to the West, I mean Europe. And uh, mainly in Italy, starting from Sicily, they found, as Mark Bloch would say, a good environment for uh, um, spreading this technique, this culture. Uh, why? Because uh, it was uh, the, the time of, uh, of the comuni, how do you say the comuni? Of, uh, of sea cities, the città marinare. Yeah, marine, marine, um, marine yes. cities and the commons. Yes, and uh, uh, in in 
In a short time, making pasta was uh, a practice that diffused all over the, the Italian coasts, from Sicily to Liguria, uh, Palermo, Genova, Pisa, La Toscana, Tutta, Napoli, e sull'altra costa, on the other coast, the Adriatic Sea, uh, Puglia, La Sardegna, everywhere, everywhere in, in Italy, um, spread this culture and the use of making and selling pasta. Even the Venetians sold, vendevano, used to, to sell pasta. They did not make it, but they brought it from Puglia and, and sold the pasta in the north. So uh, Marco Polo has nothing to do, but the Chinese has nothing to do with Italian pasta. The Chinese, the Chinese have a, a very important uh, tradition of pasta in their country. And someone supposed that, that uh, perhaps this is not uh, um, de demonstrated, that perhaps Persia was the place from, we, from where pasta uh, diffused, spread to West Italy and to East China. We don't know if this uh, um, search of one origin is uh, correct or not, but there is a, a huge difference between the Chinese and the Italian um, practices of making pasta, because in China, still today, pasta is uh, still uh, prepared fresh in Chinese houses, homes, and restaurants. Pasta is made and eaten. Immediately, Italy, since the Middle Ages, has become the only one country in the world where a trade, an industry, an industry of pasta spread from Italy to other countries, but the, the model is Italian. This is the very difference between these two pasta cultures. So when Marco Polo goes there, he finds something that he already know. So the myth of Marco Polo was invented by an American journalist at the beginning of the 20th, uh, 20th century. Uh, when it seems to me that it was uh, 1929, something like that, in a, in a newspaper that was the, the, the newspaper of the pasta industrials, industriali. Yeah, in the industrial uh, pasta. Industrial pasta in the States. Uh, they, they wrote uh, this uh, funny legend of Marco Polo that uh, goes to, to China and and uh, brings back to Italy this new idea of pasta. And an even funnier legend that uh, <laughs> in, the, in the, um, the ship of Marco Polo, there was a, a mariner, a marine. A sailor. A sailor, yes, a sailor called Spaghetti that uh, gave his name to, to this uh, new strange thing. So, but this so there is are very, a bunch it, of legends and- This uh, is incredible. It, what you said before happens to everyone talking about pasta. <laughs> I, I, I have studied food history since, uh, as, as you know, many, many decades. So I always uh, have, uh, conferences or uh, wrong. And when I touch the, the team of pasta, always, always, always someone uh, 
asks, uh, what about, why did you not talk about Marco Polo? Uh, yeah, well, I'm glad I'm glad that this evening we were able to clarify <laughs> to clarify a little bit this situation because it's become really, you know, intense. I would say uh, we have a bunch of other questions, a couple of other questions that I'm finding very interesting. For example, one is Bolognese sauce. Yes, sugo alla bolognese, which we also call ragù. Alla yes. Is it actually from Bologna? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, Bolognese sauce is actually from Bologna. Was but invented in Bologna? We, here we go again into the origins. The, the, I the don't session. know. It, I, I cannot say if it was invented in Bologna, but it actually became uh, typical of Bolognese cuisine, the ragu, the Bolognese sauce, not the spaghetti with Bolognese sauce. This is a very funny story. Mm. Um, I did not uh, uh, tell it in this book, but in another book that is over um, on uh, about the story, the history of Bolognese cuisine. Um, Bolognese sauce is from Bologna. Uh, I repeat, that does not mean that it was invented in Bologna. That means that Bologna as a city spread over the century. The, 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 most, uh, the main attention to this uh, food. So, so we can say that ragù bolognese is from Bologna while spaghetti are not typical of Bolognese cuisine. They, little, little, two, two words, um, spaghetti begin, begin to be important in Sicily, then in Genoa, and uh, from the um, 16th century on, in Naples. Naples in the, the last centuries, uh, the last centuries, I mean uh, 17th, 18th. 1700s? Yes, 1700s, yes, sorry. 1600, 1700. Naples uh, become a new uh, crucial place for pasta. Mainly for Napoletani dry... mangia maccheroni, right? Yes, yes. Maccheroni that means spaghetti because in the, the Neapolitan language, maccheroni means spaghetti. Uh, the, the term, the very term spaghetti, is very, very recent. It does, exi it does not exist uh, earlier than the half of the 19th century. I go back to Naples. So we we arrived um, at the end of the 19th century. And at this moment, um, as it, it was true from centuries, the two main gastronomic cities of Italy are Naples and Bologna. This was true also in the Renaissance and the medieval times. So, what happens in, in the last decades of the 19th century? It happens that Italy exists now, become to be a, 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 also a political country, not only a cultural country as it was in the Renaissance times, when everyone talked about Italy, but uh, Italy was uh, the culture, it was literature, it was music, it was uh, arts, uh, architecture, it was uh, gastronomy. But uh, since uh, 1961, Italy 
as born, he is born as a country, a political country. So, um, uh, they, they, uh, so they invent, they, what means they, I, I will say it uh, in a moment, they invent a new dish that is uh, the, the synthesis of Italy taking the Neapolitan pasta, spaghetti, and Bolognese sauce. Oh. Spaghetti <laughs> Napoletani al ragù bolognese. This is the first name we have for this dish. Um, and where this happens, this happened in Torino. That was uh, not uh, at the time, uh, no more the capital of Italy, but was in fact the, the city, the place where Italy was conceived and re realized. So Torino uh, is the, the city, is the place uh, where at the end of the 19th century, we find in many uh, hotels and restaurants for the first time, this uh, dish that brings together Naples and Bologna. So, and in Turin, it must have been very exotic, <laughs> right? Yes, uh, yes, it was exotic, but it was, uh, a, um, how do I say, a political invention mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. for saying uh, this is a dish for Italy. That's a, yeah, that's beautiful to put together the regions. Huh? But in fact, outside of Bologna and outside of Italy, Spaghetti alla Bolognese that in Bologna do, do not exist. Uh, okay, so my question power, is quick questions power. with ragu, with sugo alla Bolognese, what kind of pasta you should use? In Bologna, this uh, kind of ragu is only used with fresh pasta, mainly tagliatelle. Ecco, eh, yeah. But, I agree. <laughs> but I must say, on, honestly, I must say that spaghetti alla bolognese are, are very good. Even I agree. If the Bolognese people uh, hor is hor 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 horrified. 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 Yes. Yes. That you put uh, the ragu on the spaghetti. Huh? It's, a, it's a, very, a very interesting story. And now you are mentioning the tagliatelle all'uovo, the egg pasta. Yes. So one of our attendees here, James, is asking, uh, he's actually saying, in the really fun book, Heat, written a few, a few years ago, the author's great quest, cioè la ricerca, was to find the first mention of using an egg in pasta. Mm -hmm. It seems true that Sicily and Southern Italia do not use eggs in their pasta, but the North does. Yes, this is true. It's true. Yes, it's true. And uh, this, this situation goes back to the at least the Renaissance. And, but very, there is a very simple explication for that. And that is that uh, um, il grano duro, durum. The hard, yeah, the durum, uh, hard, wheat. Durum wheat. Durum wheat. Mm. Durum wheat grows only in the south of Italy. And durum wheat is uh, um, necessary and to, today is always mandatory in, in a legal sense but a part of that if you if you make it pasta spaghetti macaroni with durum wheat you don't need egg because this kind of flour is already compact is already yeah. self uh, keeping consistent yeah consistent consistent yeah. while uh, il grano tenero tender yeah the tender wheat, wheat that grows in the north part of italy needs eggs 
to 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 co co to adhere to stay together yes, to mm -hmm. stay to stay together to be compact. So that that is the reason why. I didn't know. That's very interesting. Yeah. We have another couple of questions that we need to, you know, to, if you can. Yes. First of all, this is just a comment, un commento. Uh, do you know that pasta and sugo di pomodoro in Argentina is called tallarina con tucco? No, I never heard about it. No, no. no. Con tucco, what, eh, what, I don't what know. Means? I don't know tucco what it means. Tagliarines, we can all understand the tagliarini, tagliarini. Tucco maybe means uh, pomodoro, ma, but I don't know. Maybe some, some other of our attendees can, can tell us. And then it, we it, have it, uh, can, G. Can, can I say just one very, very yeah, of course. observation about Argentina? Argentina has a, a very interesting dish that, uh, um, like the Spaghetti Bolognese brings together two different traditions and la uh, Milanese Napoletana. That is a cotolette Milanese fried as they do in Milano, but uh, um, then added with uh, tomato sauce. But I must um, say that we see this a lot in the States too. I have mm -hmm. never seen it in my life life in Italy before, but when I came to the States, I saw what they call, uh, for example, chicken parmigiana. Chicken mm -hmm. parmigiana, it's a sort of a cotoletta di pollo, fried chicken with the tomato sauce on it. And yes. I, for me, it was completely new. It must be, it must be a, a legacy of Italian American of the immigration, probably. It's more considered an Italian American dish, I think. I, I must say that all these uh, observations and uh, stories, I find them very, very nice and very interesting from an historical point of view. I completely and, agree. I agree. They're very fascinating. Th okay, very quickly, because I don't want to keep you too long, Professor Montanari. For you, it's midnight, but we have another <laughs> couple of questions. Let's see if we can, if no, we no. can uh, uh, answer. We, so, we Jean, can Jean is asking if pasta con le sarde is typical of Sicily. And yes. it, if so, do you know from what city if there's a city or it's all Sicily? Pasta con le sarde is typical of uh, uh, Sicily, especially Palermo. And uh, uh, when Pellegrino Artusi, do you know this name, Pellegrino Artusi? Pellegrino and Artusi, uh, one of the most famous uh, food writer in the 1800s. Writer, at the end of the 19th century, and uh, he, he collected the uh, recipes for, from all regions of Italy, even when he did not know them, because uh, he worked uh, on uh, the uh, mail that he um, got from uh, readers. And uh, this uh, um, recipe of pasta con le sarde uh, is inclu included in the second edition of Pellegrino Ortuzzi's recipe book because he had received uh, from by from from from, from a, a lady from a lady from a Sicilian lady this recipe and he decided to to get to to to, to put it into the the book so. Yum. Yum. Buono, Palermo, Palermo. Uh, Kathy, Kathy's asking something about lasagna. When was first introduced? What country initiated this innovation? But we know that lasagna la goes back quite a lot. Yes, we must think the elder, no, the oldest lasagna. We have the first recipe of lasagna in the first recipe book of Italy that uh, is uh, uh, dated from the beginning of the 14th century. So we must imagine a lasagna exactly made as they make it today. Layers of pasta, but 
only with cheese. That means without meat and without tomato. This is the medieval lasagna. That's the shape of this dish is always the same. Yeah, that's fabulous. Very interesting. I, I, I also think that lasagna goes back to the Roman times. La, yes. Lasanga, losanga. Yes, yes, but in the, the name is probably uh, Latin. La, la, Latin, yeah, Latin. La, lagana, lagana. Mm -hmm. But uh, for uh, uh, the, the Latin, the ancient Roman language, lagana was uh, um, the sheet of pasta. What we, we call today as folia. Okay. Uh -huh. So it could also be used in the shape of lasagna, but uh, uh, mainly from the Middle Ages on, it becomes a real uh, uh, important popular dish. Wow. That's so uh, very fascinating. Okay, so we are, ah, by the way, uh, somebody wrote, and thank you, uh, somebody wrote, Tuco is the Genovese word for sugo. Ah, sugo. Eh, sugo, sugo. So, like, tagliarina is al tuco, eh, tagliarina al sugo. Yeah. Mm. Also, somebody is asking this. Can you comment on the last chapter of your book, regarding how identity does not correspond to roots. Quotes, in virgolette, searching for the origins of what we are may just be, therefore, a way of getting to know others, the others who live in us. And he continues, as an American who has just obtained their Italian citizenship, your book has touched me tremendously. I thank you very much because uh, I think that uh, talking about cuisine and food and gastronomy is not a, a light way of making history, but is a way for making history even in very deep um, thoughts like this. I think that talking about identity and, and roots uh, is, uh, is often uh, an ambiguous uh, way of, uh, of thinking and uh, talking because uh, the two things, things, identity and roots, are often um, sovrapposte, are often thought as similar, the same thing. What, what I, I wanted to do with this book is showing that searching the origins, searching the roots has nothing to do with the, what we call identity because the roots are in the past. Identity is now. And now is the way the roots have changed, have uh, um, encountered other roots, has uh, uh, made the, all that I have tried to, to, to tell you this evening uh, before going to bed. <laughs> I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. And um, okay, so I think it's time now for, to send you to bed. We have another couple of questions, but you know, I, I, I don't want to overwhelm you. Two minutes. Okay, two minutes. Which region has the poorest cuisine? Are there political and cultural region, reasons for this? Poorest. Maybe in the past. Nowadays we eat so much everywhere. I think that uh, in Italy there is no region with poor. If you mean poor, as uh, no interesting cuisine. The, the, the real richness of Italy is that everywhere you go, you find a very interesting cuisines and always different from each other. This is the real, I think, Italian cuisine. And also the poorest sometimes, the poor cuisine is very good. I mean, I'm thinking about Tuscany, where I'm from, that has a lot of poor 
cuisine yes. because of the origins of being peasants or from the country and it's so good it's uh, papal pomodoro ribollita right with with stale bread uh, we were able to create cucina povera exactly mary uh yes. still yes. cucina povera creates delicious dish yes but but the real uh, forza strength of italian food culture is that since the middle ages uh, high cuisine the cuisine made in the courts by high cooks important cooks and written in recipe important recipe books was not so far away from popular poor cuisine but uh, in a way imitated it uh, took from used to take from poor cuisine uh, um, experiences uh, know how uh, the, the 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 knowledge of uh, uh, plants of wild plants uh, and uh, so um, even the high cuisine in italy had a contact a, a strong contact with poor cuisine and i think this is a, the real secret of the richness of italian cuisine I agree. Okay, some quick comments. Fabulous program. Thank you so much. Grazie, molto interessante, divertente. Uh, we have a lot of Italian speakers. Uh, enjoyed this very much. Fantastico, grazie mille, grazie a Ian Books. Great presentation, Professor Montanari. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to close the program now because we need to send our guest to bed. It's it's uh, past midnight in Italy, but I would like to thank you all, the many of you who participated. Tonight we had a lot, a lot, a lot of participants. Please check our upcoming events because we have so many uh, on our website or on our uh, on our check on our um, mailing list if you are not in the, in the mailing list please sign up also i would like to remind you if you would like to read this very interesting book it's short sweet and short beautiful very interesting uh, you will have a discount since you participated to our uh, webinar you can find the discount in the chat that I just wrote, or you will get it through uh, your registration on Zoom. E con questo chiudo, I would like to lastly uh, again uh, thank the professor, thank Fitch, Friends of Italian Cultural Center Boston, and the consulate for making it all possible. Professor Montanari, speriamo di rivederla presto perché è stato molto interessante. I would have many more questions and probably I, our participants too. But you know what? Probably we will meet again. How about that? Keep your question for the next time. Sì, veramente, veramente. Grazie tantissime, ciao, buonanotte, ciao. buon riposo e arrivederci a tutti alla prossima volta. Ciao! Ciao!